so we've been journeying through the gospel of Mark, and we've been learning all different kinds of things about who Jesus is. In the last several weeks, we have been following along with Jesus and the disciples as they were on the way to Jerusalem. All kinds of things that he challenged us with and, and what it means to follow Christ, but now he really gets in our business. And he really challenges us to, to understand now that he's in Jerusalem and, and the very place he was destined to, the place that he knew was going to mean his life. He wants us to understand that as followers of Jesus, he has a call in our lives. And there are some things that he wants to say to us that might be rather strong. Uh, Tim Hall preached for us last Sunday, and, and as he described the, the passage that I asked him to preach and the message that he gave, he said, you know, Len, that was really a smash-mouth kind of sermon to really challenge us in what it means to follow Jesus. Well, it's only going to get stronger as we go through, so buckle up. Because Jesus will not settle for a little bit of our lives. Any Neil Diamond fans here? I'll confess, I like Neil Diamond. He's got a song. His song is, Leave a little room for God As you go along your way Kind of a, yeah, he's got a nice mellow voice, right? Completely misses the point of a relationship with God. God is not interested in a little room. God will have everything or he will have nothing. Jesus is the great fork in the road. When we come to Jesus, we will either see him and accept him for who he says he is, or we will see him as something else, which in his mind is a rejection of all that he is and all that he says and all that he stands for. So as we come to Mark chapter 11, Pastor and author Tim Keller kind of draws this fork in the road out for us when he says, he's speaking of Jesus, he says, he forces our hand at every turn in the story. This man who throws open the gates of his kingdom to everyone, then warns the most devout insiders that their standing in the kingdom is in jeopardy without fruitfulness, is forever closing down options. He is both the rest and the storm, both the victim and the wielder of the flaming sword, and you must accept him or reject him on the basis of both. Either you'll have to kill him or you'll have to crown him. The one thing you cannot do is just say, what an interesting guy. So in Mark chapter 11, Jesus forces the people of Jerusalem and the religious leaders and every person who has ever lived from the time of Christ to, the, to this day to either crown him or kill him. Turning your Bibles to Mark chapter 11. We're going to start in verse 1. As you're finding your way there, it's page 708 if you're using one of the pew Bibles. By the way, if you don't happen to own a Bible, the, the Bible in the pew is, is yours, uh, our gift to you. We would love to get God's Word into your hands. But as you're turning there to Mark chapter 11, page 708, when a king returned home after a victorious campaign, he entered into his, his capital city with all the might and circumstance and, and pomp, might and power, excuse me, and pomp and circumstance. His arrival was met with, with che cloud, uh, crowds cheering wildly People throwing things, you know, ticker tape, not throwing at him, but, but so celebrating him, ticker tape parades, all that sort of thing. And then it culminated with that victorious king entering more than likely a temple where he would either make sacrifices to honor the gods that he worshipped or he would sacrifice his nemesis who they brought in on display in chains. He would ride in on his the most powerful white steed that they could find. Jesus is about to enter Jerusalem. He is the 
the sovereign of God's kingdom about to enter his capital city. He will move to his palace, the temple. And this is how that turns out in Mark chapter 11. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and to Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter in, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied at a doorpost in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing, untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. They brought the colt to Jesus, threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed after were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a pole. Not even a, a yearling. This, this donkey was not even a year old. It, had, it, it was unbroken. It had never been sat on, never been saddled. Jesus did this to contrast the kingdom of God and the king that would be God's to the world's kings. He wasn't going to be that kind of king that would ride in on the white steed. He wasn't going to be that kind of king that was going to wipe out his enemies as he came into Jerusalem, and nobody understood that. And so as Jesus came into this place, you find people who were gathering around him as he came celebrating. And they, they threw their, their, their outer garments, their cloaks, they, they, they threw branches that they were able to cut from the trees and the fields near them and and they they called out hosanna hosanna means save save now save us and it was it was almost like an 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 antiphonal one side would call out the other side would answer so one side would say hosanna the other side would say blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord then they would say hosanna or or blessed is the uh, david's coming king and they'd say hosanna in the highest and they would call back and forth. And so it was loud and it was celebratory and it was incredible and it was an awesome, awesome experience. And they did it. Jesus did this and they did it in response because Jesus was fulfilling a prophecy that had been made in Zechariah 9 and verse 9. In Zechariah 9 and verse 9, we read, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. What Jesus was really doing here was he was forcing the hands of the people of Jerusalem as well as the religious leaders. Because when he did this, he was doing two things. He was, first of all, declaring that he was that prophesied Messiah, And he was also giving them a challenge. No place to hide. They would either have to crown him or they would kill him. The words that they said to him, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is David's king. Comes from Psalm 118. Psalm 118 was was a psalm that was written to foretell this promised Messiah, this promised King. It says, Save us, we pray, O Lord, or Lord, we pray. Give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And listen to this last line. We bless you from the house of the Lord. As the Messiah entered Jerusalem and came to the temple, praise should have gushed towards him from that temple, from his palace but as jesus neared the crescendo of his triumphal entry adoring crowds were calling out but they were not the crowds from jerusalem i never really thought of this before until i studied this passage 
Have you ever heard somebody say, well, the same people that cried Hosanna in the highest are the same people who cried crucify him? Not true. Here's why I say that. The people who are crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is David's king. Hosanna in the highest are the people who were traveling with Jesus from the areas of Caesarea Philippi, the area of Galilee, and the area of Judea, and from the specific towns of Jericho, Bethany, and Bethphage. They followed after him. They cried out to him. And they anticipated, because they knew this was, Jesus was fulfilling Zechariah 9.9. 9. They knew, because they said the words from Psalm 118, that this was Messiah. And everyone anticipated that as they came to Jerusalem, praise would usher forth. However, they were witness to an epic ministry fail. Verse 11 reads, He entered Jerusalem, went into the temple, and when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. No adoring crowds, no shouts of praise, no recognition, no acknowledgement at all. And so what ends up standing out the most in this scenario is that nothing stood out. It says Jesus entered the, 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 the temple, he looked around, and he left. We may reject, we may dismiss, or we may ignore God's sovereign King Jesus, but we will do it at our own peril. In the second psalm, God inspired the author of the Psalms to, to pen these words. And they're words that he wrote to all the rulers of the world and every single individual in their kingdom. Because he wanted them to understand that you can dismiss my king, you can reject my king, you can mock my king, you can kill my king. But you will do it at your own peril. Listen to these words from Psalm 2. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Now Jesus wanted them to understand this, and he wanted to bring this to them. He was telling them, You don't have any options. You will either crown me or you will kill me, but those are your only options. You cannot dismiss me because every single one of us will have to decide what will we do with Jesus. And then in this passage, he shares with us an interesting um, situation that, that Jesus encounters. And it's, it's one of the most well-known but little understood incidences that can really unlock this passage to us if we'll just notice what it says verse 12 on the following day when they came from bethany jesus was hungry and seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf he went to see if he could find anything on it when he came to it he found nothing but leaves for it was not the season for figs and he said to it may no one ever eat fruit from you again and his disciples heard it now it's been pointed out in this passage that it was not the season for fruit. But this tree had leaves all on it. And so some people have looked at this passage and they've said, well, you know, Jesus is unreasonable. I mean, you tell me Jesus never sinned, but he's angry here and he takes his anger out on this innocent little tree. Bertrand Russell, famous atheist, had this to say about this passage. This is a very curious story. Because it was not the right time of year for figs, and you really could not blame the tree. And then he says, I cannot myself feel that either in the matter of wisdom or in the matter of virtue, Christ stands quite as high as some other people known to history. I think I should put Buddha and Socrates above him in those respects. But there was a Roman naturalist, historian, named 
Pliny the Elder. He was a contemporary of Jesus. He lived from 23 AD to 79 AD. He understood the flora and fauna of, of the area surrounding Jerusalem. This is what he said. The fig tree is also the only tree whose leaf forms later than its fruit. So what Jesus was functioning under was the understanding of how this tree would actually function. Fruit would come first, then would come the leaves. So it would make sense that if there were leaves on this tree, that there would also be fruit on this tree. But in a study of missing the obvious point, Bertrand Russell turned his back on Jesus because he did not understand the context of what's happening here. And why Jesus would do this. It wasn't that Jesus was angry at some tree. It wasn't that Jesus was, was, had lost control that day. I mean, if Jesus was going to lose control, there were lots of other incidences where he would have done that. It had nothing to do with that at all. Jesus was trying to make a point, a point that was super subtle and if we aren't careful, we could miss that point. I think he wants to, to make this physical object lesson, use this physical object lesson to make this point, that something that has all the outward trappings of fruitfulness, but does not produce any actual fruit, comes under God's judgment. To promise fruit, but not produce fruit, brings God's judgment. Keep that principle in mind as we walk the dusty road back to the temple with Jesus and his followers. In verse 18, 15, excuse me. They came to Jerusalem. He entered the temple and began to drive those out who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the temples of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry through, excuse me, carry anything through the temple. And, if, and he was teaching them and saying to them, it is, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it, and they were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when the evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. So when you first walked into the temple, the largest part of the complex was called the Court of the Gentiles. Now, the court of the Gentiles was the place where people from all over the globe were to come and connect with God. It was to be about worshiping God, all the nations, all the people. God is a missionary God. He wants relationship with every single person on the face of the earth. No matter race, nationality, economic standing, creed, it does not matter. God loves every single person on the earth and he wants a relationship with them and the temple the very seat of worship for Israel was the gathered to be the gathering place for the Gentiles they were to be able to come there listen to what he says in Isaiah 56 let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say the Lord will surely separate me from his people why do you think people of the world would think that because sometimes religious people think they're better than everybody else. Sometimes religious people think, well, God is on my side and he's not on your side. You ever wonder why God doesn't often answer the prayers in, in, a, in a, a sports team's huddle? That doesn't matter to him. What, it, what matters to him is the hearts of every person. What matters to him is that the world know that he's a gracious, good God and they can come to him. And because we have relationship with him does not make us better than other people. It makes us endeared to God to take what we have and share it with other people. And that's what Israel was supposed to do. The Lord will surely separate me from his people was their fear. The foreigners who joined themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, 
everyone who keeps the Sabbath does not profane it, holds fast my covenant. These I will bring to my holy mountain. I want them here. I came for them. And I will make um, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the peoples. The court of the Gentiles was to be a house of prayer. But the court of the Gentile had become the place where all this, the animals were kept. And the business of worship created such a loud and frenzied atmosphere that they couldn't even think, let alone pray. And there was really no room for them. There was a Jewish historian named Josephus who said on an annual basis around this time of Passover, there would be some 255,000 lambs sold, bought, and sacrificed on top of the birds and, and all the other accoutrements that they had to, to provide for people who were traveling long distance for worship. The noise was probably more like the trading floor on Wall Street. God's house was not the house of prayer. Praying and reaching the people of the world was replaced with the business of worship. So here's the point Jesus is drawing out for us. The fig tree promised fruit, but there was none. The temple promised the fruit of worship, but there was none. Like the tree, the dysfunctional, fruitless temple faced utter destruction. And there is a serious warning for First Baptist Church, for every follower of Jesus. If our lives promise fruit, but do not produce fruit, there's something dysfunctional in our relationship with him. I don't know about you, but for me it's easy to let myself get busy doing the things of God and not spend time with God. Like the temple those who worshipped it, worshipped at the temple, and those who led from the temple. I can lose focus on the mission that God has given me to pray or connect with him personally and reach the world. So I guess the question that, that God has been bringing to my mind for me as I've been studying this passage and that I think we need to consider is if Jesus were to come in this place, would he be turning over temples, uh, tables, excuse me? Would he be turning over tables? Would he be getting rid of the different things that we have developed that are supposed to enhance our worship of him, but actually distract our worship of him? Or would he find us, you and me, engaged in prayer? seeking not just to know him for ourselves as we sing but also seeking him on behalf of others who need to know him desperately praying reaching a world that's lost and dying now Jesus doesn't just stay there that's hard enough but then he, he, he says that you have made my temple which should be a house of prayer into a den of robbers. What does that mean? Well, I want to read from the message version because it, I think it draws out the, the language of our day fairly well. Do you think you can rob and murder, have sex with the neighborhood wives, tell lies nonstop? So, I forgot to tell you something. That, when that phrase, den of robbers, and the, the, the passage there that he's referring to is from Jeremiah chapter 7. And in Jeremiah chapter 7, there we go, out of the message we read, Jeremiah chapter 7, verse uh, 9 to 11. Do you think you can rob and murder, have sex with the neighborhood wives, tell lies nonstop, worship the local gods, and buy every novel religious commodity on the market, and then march into this temple 
set apart from my worship and say, we're safe. Thinking that the place itself gives you a license to go on with this outrageous sacrilege. So the version we looked at said, Den of Robbers. The message says, says a cave full of criminals. Do you think you can turn this temple set apart from my worship into something like that? Well, think again. I've got eyes in my head. I can see what's going on. What does he say? When we live like we want during the week and then come here and think all is well, our place of worship becomes a hideout for robbers, a cave full of criminals. What are we robbing? How am I being a criminal? I'm claiming that there's fruit in my life, but there isn't any. I'm robbing the world of seeing God in me. And I'm coming here and feeling good about myself. And that spiritual dysfunctionality caused God to shut down the temple, the entire sacrificial system. Sometimes we think, well, you know, God wouldn't do that. He doesn't need any of us. He gives us the privilege and honor to be part of what he's doing. But he wants us to understand that this is serious business. Now, is he saying you've got to be perfect? Is he saying, hey, there's a list of rules, rights, and wrongs? No, he's not saying any of that. None of that. He's saying surrender your heart to me. That's what I want. When you surrender your heart to me, guess what's going to happen? I'm going to change your heart. When, you, when I change your heart, guess what you're going to do? You're going to want more of me, and you're going to want others to know me too. How did Jesus summarize the law? Two things. Love. Love God. And love others. Love neighbors. Right? You don't sound very convinced. Let's try that again. Love God. Love others. That's, that's what he calls us to do. But you know what? We can't do it in ourselves. It's continually surrendering ourselves. It's that song, the last song we sang, was a reminder to us that, that I only can live for God when I surrender to God. We, we have this idea that we are supposed to become like Christ. And you're thinking to yourself, well, yeah, Len, there's several passages that say that. I'm supposed to become like Christ, but... Whose job is it to make me like Christ? Is it my job? No. What's my job? My job is to die daily to myself. To die daily. And as I die, what am I doing? I'm crowning him. I'm inviting him to come into my life that day and radically change me. When a person's daily life does not conform with their professed relationship with God, there is something gravely dysfunctional in their spiritual world. No matter how you define is, your public life is inseparably linked to and informed by your private life. Are you the same person when you're in your room alone and nobody's watching God is not just about making me act nicer more civilized even more moral he will settle for nothing less than total transformation so that each of us become grow into people of integrity people who are whole which is what integrity means people who are the same in public as they are in private. Now the cool thing about that is God doesn't expect perfection. Perfection is what Jesus has. But he does want fruit. The fruit of a changed heart, the fruit of a changed life, the fruit of people coming to know Christ. He does want that. But the beautiful thing about anything God requires of us is he never expects us to do it. 
He expects us to realize that we can't do it. And so we come to him. I cannot even make my heart desire God more. As long as we're in the flesh, the flesh is going to war against the spirit. And so my job is to say, God, I know I, I want to want you. I long to long for you. Will you, will you do that work in me? And he does. That's what he does. That's how he works. Worship is not a Sunday morning event. Worship is life. I found this quote this morning from C.S. Lewis. We are mirrors whose brightness, if we are bright, is wholly derived from the sun that shines upon us. We are mirrors whose brightness, if we are bright, is wholly derived from the sun that shines upon us. Worship is me surrendering all that I have and all that I am. And the consequences for those of us who will choose to stay in our phoniness using church as a place to hide are dire. Look at verse 20. They passed by in the morning and they saw the fig tree wither away to its roots. Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look. The fig tree you cursed, the fig tree you cursed has withered. So Jesus is rewriting the script between private practice and personal lives and public worship. In the next few verses, he's going to describe what, what he's looking for. He's turning away from the dysfunctional temple who, like the fig tree, is withered from the roots up which means it's been dead for a long time. And he's turning to his disciples and saying, look, I'm, I'm going to make a new, a new community, a new house of prayer. And in this house of prayer, it will transcend buildings. It will transcend walls and mortar and brick. It will transcend one nationality to include nations from all over the globe. People of all height, all, all, all sizes, all shapes, all colors, all languages. And he is going to invite them to not just one place, but they will gather in homes. They will gather in buildings like this. They will gather all over the globe. And the purpose of this community is to, to be a new house of prayer. And this new praying community will replace the dysfunctional temple. Verse 22. Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Jesus' new community is a community of prayer that will be characterized by two things. These two characteristics, the first of which, Jesus says, is that this praying community is a faith in a mountain-moving God community. Moving mountains is God's business. Can you imagine if every single one of us were to be able to pray to that mountain there be moved. Judy starts praying and it moves over here. Brenda starts praying and it moves over there. Lois, who doesn't see very well, starts praying and it lands on top of us. <laughs> That's not his point. His point is the object of your faith is most important. It is the mountain moving God who can do everything and anything. There is not an obstacle too big that cannot be dealt with by this mountain moving God. 
And so this, this new community is a, is a faith community. It's a community that says, God, I will trust you for everything. I will trust you with my very life. I will trust you with every resource that you've poured into my hands. I will give it back to you. It's not about me deciding what God will do, trying to bend his will to mine. We completely misunderstand this passage when that's what we think. It is about me surrendering to him and letting his will be worked out in me so that I will say like Jesus, not my will, but yours be done. This new community is a faith community. I think he started with that because the next thing that he says typifies this community is really Verse 25, some commentators wonder if this verse was just kind of inserted here, but it, 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 there's no textual reason to not see it as part of this. So I, I think Jesus is saying something very critical that we need to make sure we don't miss. Verse 25 gives us a second characteristic. And whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. The second characteristics of this new praying in faith community is forgiveness. He wants us to forgive. Just as our relationship personally with Jesus is based solely on our faith in the finished work of Christ and his forgiveness of our sins, so Jesus' new praying in faith community is based on our faith in God and our willingness to forgive others. Now, what he's not saying here is if you do not forgive, then you've never been forgiven. He is saying that if you do not forgive, then you do not understand the depth of your own sin. And he, you do not understand what it took for Jesus to forgive you. Now, I said this was really hard, and I want to be careful here. I know that many of us, whether in this room or people that you know, have been abused, you have been hurt, you have been victimized, and I am not making light of that at all. But I think we need to be careful, because sometimes we feel justified in hating somebody, being angry at somebody because they have wronged us. And clearly, you've been wronged. But unforgiveness is like eating poison and hoping someone else dies. He says his community is going to be a community based on faith and what Christ who Christ is and what he's done, as well as a community based on forgiveness. The forgiveness he gives us and the forgiveness that we are able to give others. But remember what I said earlier? He never asks us to do something that he does not enable us to do. And there are times when I have had to pray, and you probably have as well, God, I know I should do this, but I can't. Will you do it? And he will do that. A heart willing to forgive is evidence that we understand the depth of our own sin. So he's not saying, you have to do this right now. He's saying, let your heart be willing to surrender your right to hold on to this, to make them pay. Bring it to me. If I come to God asking forgiveness for my sin, and while I'm sinning against one of God's children by holding a grudge, then I'm living in the dysfunction, the hypocritical, faux worship of the original temple that was destroyed. We are not justified in hating someone else or holding a grudge, even if they have sinned against us. Peter then takes and gives the positive side of this coin. He says, do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. What's he saying here? My unwillingness to forgive 
it withholds God's blessing from me. It's my heart that's weighed down by my unforgiveness. The person who wronged us might not even remember. Could it be that while Jesus hung on the cross and he he uttered the famous words, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. That he did that as much for his own benefit as theirs. Because he did not want his heart contaminated by unforgiveness. That is hard. That is not something that any of us could do in and of ourselves. We are never more like Jesus than when we forgive. And when we forgive, we not only open the door for the restoration of our relationships, but we invite the free flow of God's blessing into our lives. Highly recommend this book titled True Face, Trust God and Others with Who You Really Are. I found this story, true story, about Leonardo da Vinci. A distinguished draftsman, engineer, artist, and thinker, Leonardo da Vinci is one of the outstanding intellects of history. Just before he started painting The Last Supper, he had a violent quarrel with a fellow painter. Enraged and bitter, Leonardo determined to paint the face of his enemy, the other artist, as the face of Judas, and thus take out his revenge by sending this man down to infamy. Judas was one of the first faces he painted. I like this part. And everyone recognized the face of the painter with whom Leonardo quarreled. <laughs> He's good, right? But when Leonardo came to paint the face of Christ, he could make no progress. Something was holding him back, frustrating his best efforts. Eventually, he came to the conclusion that the thing checking and frustrating him was that he had painted his enemy as Judas. He decided to paint out the face of Judas and start fresh on the face of Jesus. He did, and this time, with success, which the ages have acclaimed. I want to read the rest of what the author says. Leonardo experienced the power and genius of grace. He had discovered a universal truth. We cannot simultaneously paint the features of Christ into our lives and paint another face with the colors of enmity and hatred. But Len, you don't understand how bad that person hurt me. And I don't. I know the deep hurts that I have had and the struggles that I have had to surrender those to God. And I am not going to downplay or, or be cavalier with your pain. But Jesus comes to each of us and says, I want to take that from you. I like what he says here. He says, where does God stand in relation to the sin done against me? Where does God stand? He wants me to forgive. Where does he stand? They, they sinned against me. Where does he stand? He stands with us. He has his arm around us, giving us his perspective on the sin and the one who sinned. He's close enough for us to hear him say, if you ask me, I, and I hope you do, you should forgive this person as my son forgave you. Trust me with this advice. I'll heal you. I'll restore you. I'll free you. Jesus knew praying in faith community that displaces the dysfunctional hypocritical temple is a forgiving community. Are you facing an obstacle so big you cannot imagine a way around it, over it, or through it? In the pew in front of you, there's a prayer card. I want to invite you to take a stand in this community and to write that mountain-sized dilemma down because we're going to pray with you about that. That's what this church needs to be about. Have you been harboring unforgiveness in your heart? 
maybe you have been sinned against and it was horrid can you say to your father I can't do this what you ask of me is way too much but I trust you I love you here it is you do the work that I can't and you know what you don't have to just say okay I forgive you now God is committed to you. He wants to have the free flow of blessing in your life and mine. So he's going to work with you. He'll go at your pace. But he will challenge you. See, when it boils down to it, we all have two options. We will either kill Christ or we will crown him. Which choice we make is up to us. My prayer is that we crown Jesus. That we join his new community. Let's grow together in this new community. Where we pray in faith and we forgive. Let's pray together. Jesus, I, I'm just blown away by how well you know my heart. there is no place for me to hide you have revealed me on every verse of this passage I'm a man who's held on to unforgiveness I'm a man who has wanted to see someone pay for what they did Father I pray that you would work in each of our hearts that right now wherever our minds are that we would bring our mountain sized dilemmas to you offer them up to you surrender invite you to do the work that only you can do just take a moment and do that also come to you. Maybe we're angry at you. Maybe we feel like you shouldn't have let that horrible thing happen to us. Maybe we just don't understand 